Some time ago now, I interviewed Jason Stoddard from Shit Audio, and in the course of that interview, Jason mentioned what a fan he is of their own Shit Bifrost 2 deck. Now, of course, he's a fan of their own products, that shouldn't be surprising. What was surprising, though, was that Jason said he actually prefers the Bifrost 2 to the Yggdrasil, which I'm going to talk about in a second, not because it's necessarily better than the Yggdrasil, but because it's so compact and yet provides, according to Jason, much the same performance as the Yggdrasil. As soon as I got a Bifrost 2 on my desk, I'm like, yeah, get this Yggdrasil out of here just because it's so close and it's tiny, you know? <laughs> wow. I don't want to deal with it anymore. So that comment from Jason stuck in my mind. And then with the release of the new versions of the Yggdrasil, there's the OG version, which I have here. And then there's their less is more and more is less versions. I was really keen to get my hands on the Yggdrasil and find out just how much better it might be compared to the Bifrost 2. And whether I agree with Jason about the Bifrost 2 being the better choice potentially, both from a cost and a space saving point of view. What I have here in front of me, as I've already alluded to, is the shit Yggdrasil DAC. Now specifically, this is the OG version, and the OG version is the same as what's been around for many, many years. It's been upgraded over the years with things like the analog output board being upgraded, and also the Unison USB circuit being added in. So there have been upgrades, but the general gist of this has been the same for many years. Now recently, Shit Audio produced two different versions of this DAC to add to the OG version that I have here. The new versions being the less is more and the more is less. Both of those variants are designed to do things like measure better and or cost less. And so originally I was hoping this review was going to compare all three. Unfortunately due to things like COVID, shipping costs, the general cost of the units, all of those sorts of things conspired to prevent me from being able to do a three flavor comparison. And so instead, the wonderful people over at Shoot Audio were kind enough to send me the OG Iggy because that was the one that I felt was going to be most in line with my personal tastes. And so I was really keen to see just how good of a DAC it was, how much better it is than the Bifrost 2, which shares much of the same approach as the Iggy, and also, of course, to compare it to some other devices. Before we get into any details, I just want to mention that the OG version you see here retails for $2,599 US dollars. So it's not a cheap DAC by any stretch, but it's also not one of the most expensive DACs on the market, despite being the flagship DAC from Shit Audio. And so with all that in mind, let's talk about the features and functions of the Yggdrasil OG. One of the things that makes the Shit Audio DAC so unique in the market is the fact that they're using non-audio digital to analog conversion chips. On top of that, they're then applying their own proprietary filtering processes, which are specifically designed to maintain the original samples in the recording and also make sure that the timing of transients and information like that in the audio signal is really faithfully reproduced. One of the things that Shit Audio talk about on the website is that their choice of using the digital to analog conversion chips that they do, which as I mentioned, are not actually designed for audio. But the reason they've chosen those is that they believe they're more consistently accurate than an R2R approach, and also that they provide additional benefits that traditional Delta Sigma chips can't provide. So that's the theory from Shit Audio's point of view. Of course, my job here is to find out if the proof is in the pudding. 
one of the unique things that the Shoot Audio Design does. And this has all been put together by Mike Moffat, who is a well-known expert in the field of digital audio. He's been working in digital audio forever and ever, and is a bit of a guru in the space. What he's done is he's come up with this processing system for the Shit Audio Multibit DAX, where what it's doing is it's keeping all the original samples, but it's also upsampling and interpolating what the samples would be in between the original samples to come up with the ultimate combination of both the resolution of upsampled audio without throwing away the original samples. And the idea as I understand it behind that is that it's retaining the integrity of the original samples whilst also improving the accuracy of the output analog signal. I'm not gonna to try to explain it in further depth because I'm not qualified to, but I do hope to have an interview with Mike in the coming months. So let me know down below, is that something you'd like to see on the channel? Do you want me to have a chat with Mike and see if we can understand more of why the multi-bit approach does what it does? One side effect of using the approach that they do is that shit audio DACs do not handle DSD. So if you do have DSD in your library, A, this might not be a good DAC for you, or B, you're going to have to downsample it back into PCM and to a maximum sample rate of 192 kilohertz and 24-bit audio. If you're new to the hobby and unfamiliar with things like sample rates and whatnot, if you're running Tidal, Cobas, Spotify, normal CD audio, it's gonna do just fine with the E. None of those services or sources go above 192 kilohertz. But if you have a DSD library or you're using SACD, then the Iggy might not be a great choice. A couple of final things I wanna mention about the internal design of this before we look at the inputs, outputs, the front panel, all that sort of stuff. But a couple of the final internal pieces are that this uses a fully discrete analog output stage, meaning that it doesn't rely on chip-based op-amps, and that should in theory provide for a better quality sound with more spatial qualities. It also comes with, as I've already mentioned, the Unison USB socket, and that means that it's also a galvanically isolated USB circuit. Now what that means is that if there's any noise coming through your USB chain from your PC or your streamer, however you're connecting it up, that noise is not going to get past the USB socket on the DAC and into the circuit of the DAC itself. There's many DACs coming out now with galvanic isolation and it does seem to consistently result in better and more consistent quality sound. It's going to rely less on the quality of your USB output and more on the quality of the internals of the device. The final thing to mention is that inside this massive chassis of a DAC, there are two separate power supplies, one for the digital stage and one for the analog output stage. The theory being that by keeping them separate, you can customize the power supplies for each circuit and also make sure that there's not noise coming from one and getting into the other. Now again, I'm not gonna sit here and try and say which is better or worse, if it's the right design, the wrong design. I'm just here to listen and share with you my thoughts as well as explaining some of the design principles that have been applied by Mike Moffat and the team at Shit Audio. And so with all of that said, let's now take a look at this beast of a DAC. Now, as you can see, this thing is like having a small battleship sitting on your desk. It's absolutely massive. It's got this beautiful brushed metal cover, which folds all the way around the device. And on the back and sides is a nicely painted metal chassis. I've already mentioned why this is so big, and that's because there are two massive power supply transformers inside here. And so they make up a lot of the weight and size of the DAC. But there's also a fair bit of circuitry as well. What that circuitry allows for, in addition of course to the digital decoding process, is that we've got multiple inputs and multiple outputs from the EE. Let's start off with the two at the front panel. Along the front we've got a phase switching button here. Now I talked about this briefly in the Bifrost 2 review. The phase switch allows for the fact that some recordings have got the phase altered in the actual recording. And what that means is that let's say someone's hit a drum. The strike of that drum is going to create a sound wave coming out towards the listener. But in some recordings, what's actually happened is that the polarity has been switched on the recording. And so when the drum is struck, it's actually creating a negative pressure wave rather than a positive pressure wave. Now sound is all fluctuations of positives and negatives. So all it's really doing is flipping the order in which the positive and the negative hit you. And some will say, including me, that it doesn't really make much difference to the sound. Others though will swear that switching the polarity makes a difference, and so shit audio have allowed you to do that. Moving on from that button, we've then got a series of indicator lights which tell you what the sample rate is the DAC is working at. And this is set up in a really simple way. It uses a 44 times or a 48 times base sample rate light, and then a multiplication light from that. So if you listen to 44 kilohertz audio, you're gonna see the 44 times light and the times one, meaning that it's coming out at 44 kilohertz. 
If you're listening to 88 kilohertz, then you're gonna see the 44 light and the times two. Similarly, 48 kilohertz would be 48 and the one times, and 96 kilohertz would be 48 and the two times light. There's nothing too complex, just a little bit of maths involved, but it shows you everything you need right there. The next thing you'll see on the front panel is the input selector switch. That's this big metal button here, and it allows you to cycle through the multiple inputs. I'll show you the inputs in a moment, so I'm not going to list them now. We'll have a look at that on the back panel. But then the lights that are further along the control panel down here, those are going to show you which input is selected. The final light that we've got off at the end of that row of lights is both the warm-up light, it lets you know by flashing when the unit's still warming up and not yet ready to play, or it's going to come on and stay on if you've got an issue with your source. I don't think I've ever had either the Bifrost 2 or the Iggy show that light to me, so it's not like it's going to be particularly prone to going off, it would only be if something was seriously wrong with your setup. Maybe a cable's been pulled loose, maybe the cable's broken, something like that. In most use cases, it's going to come on and flash at you when the device is warming up for about 30 seconds thereabouts, I haven't timed it, and then it's going to go off and you're never going to see it again. Now while we're talking about the front panel and the lights and whatnot, I have heard some people complain that switching sources on the Iggy can be a little bit slow, the same is true for the Bifrost 2, and indeed you do have to wait about a second, maybe two seconds, between each press of the button. If you're looking to do rapid comparisons from one source to the next, or cycle really quickly through the sources, it can be a minor minor hassle, but in my experience, most of the time with a DAC like this, you're going to set it and forget it. If you're regularly switching between sources, this might not be a great DAC choice for you, but if you're anything like me, and you tend to listen for an extended period to one source, and then maybe change to a different one for another extended session, there should be no issues with this at all. But it isn't as snappy as some other devices, and there's no shortcut to go straight to a source using a remote control or anything like that. So do be aware of that if that's something you need to know about, but in my opinion, it's not a deal breaker for this DAC. Now because this thing's so big, I can't get it into the focus plane of my camera, so I apologise that you can't see the detail here while it's sitting on the desk in front of me, but there'll be B-roll shown for every single one of the things I'm about to show you. Looking at the back panel of the Iggy, you can probably see that there is lots and lots of stuff going on here. And I should mention that all of these inputs and outputs are the same, regardless of whether you're buying the less is more, the more is less, or this OG version that I've got here. So if you're in the market for an Iggy, everything I'm about to talk about here is going to be true no matter which model you buy. Starting off at this end, we've got the power socket, so that's a normal IEC power socket to take mains power in to feed those transformers. And next to it, we've got the power switch. As is often the case with shit products, there is no power switch on the front, only on the back. And with a device like the Iggy, it's actually not a bad idea to leave it on the whole time, just because it takes that time to warm up every time you switch it on. Now there's been some talk around that the sound of these improves with extended time switched on and warming up, but my experience has been, and indeed some recent videos that I've seen that have done some measurements, would show that there is absolutely no benefit in having this on for a longer period in terms of sound quality. So if you would prefer to switch it off when you're not using it, and you're happy to wait for that 30 seconds to a minute or so for it to warm up when you first switch it on, you can absolutely do that. Don't feel like you're getting any lesser sound quality. Within a couple of minutes of switching this on, you're going to be getting the same sound quality as if you'd left it on for three days. So don't stress over that one. Moving on, we've then over here got our digital inputs, and one of the things I love about the Iggy is it gives you lots of choice. You've got the Unison USB, which is excellent. You've got coaxial in the form of a BNC, or an RCA style connection, you've got an optical input, and you've got AES EBU, which is essentially a balanced cable form of the standard coaxial connections. In my experience, having tested all these different inputs with different sources, what I generally find is that the differences between them are small enough that it's impossible to separate what is caused by the cables being used and the fact that they're different protocols and different connector types. It's impossible to separate that from the performance of the DAC. In other words, I believe that if you use whichever connection is suitable and convenient for you, and you use a decent quality digital interconnect to connect it up, you're going to be getting good performance. This isn't a DAC where I'd say you've really got to use X or you've really got to use Y to get the best sound. Use whichever one is convenient for you. Moving on from the digital inputs though, let's finish up talking about the analog. Now one of the things that I love about the Iggy here is that it gives you two pairs of RCA outputs and a pair of XLR outputs. 
That means that if you're anything like me and you want to have a tube amp or maybe a couple of tube amps, as well as a balanced solid state amp, you can absolutely run all of them off the single DAC without having to split cables, without having to use switch boxes, all the sorts of things which could degrade sound quality. So for me, that's a huge plus with the Iggy and one of the reasons I'm a bit of a fan. But having given away the fact that I am a bit of a fan, let me tell you about why I'm a fan, and that requires talking not just about the inputs and outputs, which are great, but also about the quality of sound that you get when you connect it up in your system. I often get requests in the comments to share with you what the setup is that I use for testing different gear, and so I'm going to start doing that more and more in videos from now on, but I want to flag the fact that I don't only test gear with one setup. I like to try it in different situations and with different combinations. But the majority of my testing for this setup was using my PC running Rune as my playback software. I then had the Curious Evolved USB cable running from the PC into the Iggy. That USB connection was via a JCAT USB card that I've reviewed here on the channel as well. And then from the Iggy, I had a pair of Curious XLR cables running out to the Burson Soloist GT amplifier. I have also extensively used the Iggy with the Sparko Labs Ares amplifier. The headphones I used most for this testing were the Hi-Fi Mansusfara and the Meza Elite. But again, I cycle through lots of different headphones when I'm doing my testing, so I make sure that I've heard different colorations, different styles of sound, etc. In isolation while listening to the Iggy with no comparisons, I describe the sound from it as rich and full, but still with a good sense of clarity and attack. Across all sorts of different instruments, the tonality seems to be consistently accurate. There's nothing I ever heard where I thought that's too bright or that's too dull or anything like that. It was always very natural and neutral. Sibilance is generally well controlled, so while there's a sense of attack, I never felt like it got too aggressive. And I have heard people talk about the Iggy being aggressive. I don't know if that's the older version Iggy's before, say, the Analog 2 board, or maybe with the old USB implementation. I definitely didn't hear any sense of sibilance or over-aggressiveness in my setup. But again, that can come down to system synergy. I've already mentioned good overall tonality, but honing in on some specifics, things like vocals, whether male or female, sounded really natural and lifelike. Likewise, drums, cymbals, other percussion, all of that sounded very lifelike too. So there was absolutely nothing I could pick any holes in when listening to the Iggy in isolation. Thinking about its spatial qualities, the soundstage is wide. It's not the widest I've heard, but it's got a decent width to it. And the depth is also fairly good. It's not the deepest I've heard. It's better than any Delta Sigma DAC that I've tried, but it's not up there with some of the R2R DACs out there. And it's probably also not as large in terms of depth as something like a Chord Hugo TT2 or even something like a Chord Cutest. What that also means is that the layering in the soundstage from front to back is better than Delta Sigma DAX, but not as good as some of those alternatives I just mentioned. And therefore, sound separation is excellent left to right, but not quite as good front to back. That's not to say it's bad, it's just that it's not the best I've heard. Again, in isolation, I think the Iggy is fantastic, but as you'll hear in a minute, I don't think it's the last word in every aspect of sound. I think it's very, very good, particularly at the price. But we'll get to that more in the comparisons. Still talking about soundstage and spatial character. The soundstage on the Iggy is fairly intimate. It's fairly close to the listener. It doesn't feel claustrophobic or overly congested, but it's not a huge expansive soundstage. It's not like something like a Hollow Audio Spring or May. It's more of a hybrid between an R2R and a Delta Sigma, where it's clearly bigger than a Delta Sigma, but not as big as most R2Rs can throw. For a pure headphone system, this may not be the best choice if you're looking for a big expansive sound but I do believe it's better than any Delta Sigma DAC I've had the chance to try so far in terms of space in the soundstage. Interestingly, I've got a new set of active speakers here at the moment. I've been playing with those using the Iggy and the Iggy was very, very impressive driving those. I'm not going to branch heavily into speaker reviews or talk in depth about that, but I would say that I think the Iggy in particular translates very well to speaker listening. As is always the case though, any of these listening tests in isolation don't tell the whole story. It's really important to understand how a DAC like this performs in comparison and contrast to some of its competition. One of the products I definitely wanted to compare it to directly was the Bifrost 2, also from Shit. 
I said at the very beginning of this video that Jason Stoddard prefers the Bifrost 2 because it's so much smaller. With that in mind, I compare the Iggy and the Bifrost 2 to see just what you're going to miss out on if you were to go for the space efficient option of the Bifrost 2 compared to the massive Iggy here. The Bifrost 2 retails for a very modest, in comparison, $699 US dollars. So you're saving a full $1700 US dollars by buying the smaller Bifrost 2. One of the tracks I used for this test was This Place Was a Shelter by Oliver Arnell. And on that track, I could hear that the two DACs are very, very similar in many ways. One of the first things that stood out to me during this comparison was the placement of the soundstage from both devices. The Bifrost 2 produces a soundstage that starts a bit further away from the listener, so it's a bit less intimate compared to the Iggy. But having said that, the Bifrost 2 also doesn't produce the same amount of depth, so it's a narrower stage that's further away compared to a more expansive stage that's a bit closer to you in the case of the EE. Now both are good in my opinion, neither is clearly better or worse, I probably prefer having a little bit more space in the sound overall, but they're both very good, just a little bit different. One of the areas for me where the Iggy clearly stepped ahead of the Bifrost 2, not by a huge margin, but enough that it was obvious was that the Iggy produced a better sense of kind of harmonic resonance, I guess you'd say. Listening to things like the cello and the piano in this track, I was hearing more of the richness of the resonance of each of those instruments when it was coming from the Iggy. That's not to say it was overly rich, because I was also actually hearing a little bit more texture and clarity in each of the instruments from the Iggy, so it was a beautifully balanced enhancement of the overall character of each individual instrument. The final thing that was clear and significant between the two devices was that the Iggy separates sounds better. Each individual instrument was just a little bit more cleanly separated from everything else going on around it. Again, it's not a huge, huge leap, but it's definitely better. And it brings it back to the question of just how much improvement you're looking for if you're spending $1,700 extra on the Iggy compared to the Bifrost. So I can completely understand after this comparison why Jason from Shit prefers the Bifrost 2 for his desktop setup. For me, if space is no object and money is no object, you'd definitely buy the Iggy out of these two. But if space and budget are a factor, I do think you're getting maybe 80-85% of what the Iggy can offer by going with the Bifrost 2. Ultimately, I'd describe the Iggy as being everything the Bifrost 2 does, but taken to a more refined and more resolving level. And so having said that, let's move on to my next comparison. But before I get there, I just wanted to share something with you. You may not be aware, but channel patrons get extra benefits over and above the videos here on the channel. You'll hear me always talk about different tracks as I'm comparing products, but channel patrons also get access to a curated set of playlists. I constantly update those playlists and I provide things like listening notes and things to listen for within each of the playlists. So if that's something you're interested in, I've got a link down below through to Patreon where you can come and check out the benefits available. If they're of interest to you, I'd love to see you join the family, and if not, that's completely fine too. Moving on with another comparison, I want to talk now about the Iggy versus the Burson Composer. I chose the Composer because it's one of the best Delta Sigma DACs that I've tried, and at $1,144 US dollars, it's about $1,500 cheaper than the Iggy. It gives you less outputs and less inputs, but I was interested to see how the sound performance went because it's also much more compact. One of the tracks that came up during this comparison was Feel No Fret by Average White Band. Now this isn't a great recording, so I did listen to some other tracks, I want to make that very, very clear. But just to share what I heard while listening to Feel No Fret, it was clear from the Iggy that it wasn't a great recording. So this isn't going to do anything to smooth over the lumps and bumps of poor recordings. In particular, what the Iggy showed me was that there's not a lot of separation in the recording of Feel No Fret. The mix itself is quite congested, all of the instruments and sounds are quite close together. On top of that, things like cymbals and snares are a little bit hazy sounding, and it is the recording. I've checked across multiple DACs, it's definitely the recording, and the Iggy showed that to me. Likewise, tom-toms in the drum kit are quite muted, they don't have a lot of attack and snap in the sound. And something else that was clear was that the vocals are quite distant. The way they've been mixed, it's like it's away from the microphone, or at least away from the listener, quite a bit. When I flipped over to the composer, again using all of the same chain, although I had to use a different USB cable because of the USB C input on the composer, switching over to the composer, I heard a fairly similar rendition of the music, showing that both are pretty accurate. But what the composer did was it ramped up the sense of clarity a little bit, but it actually did a worse job of separating the sounds. So it was like each individual sound had a little bit more edge and a little bit more attack, which gave a sense that they were more detailed, 
but at the same time, it's like it congested everything even more. I mentioned before that through the Iggy, the vocal sounded like it was off in the distance. In the case of the composer, once it compressed everything, which most Delta Sigma DAX seem to do, the result was that their vocals actually went up in the mix rather than back in the mix. And having tried this track across a few different devices, it should be back in the mix, not up in the mix. So the Delta Sigma DAX, in my opinion, aren't doing as good of a job with the spatial characteristics of the music as the Iggy is. They might give you a better sense of clarity and sharpness to some of the sounds, but at the same time it can come at the cost of a more congested presentation on a track like this one that's already quite congested. Beyond that, I felt like I was hearing all of the same issues with the track from the composer that I heard from the Iggy, but there was something missing from the composer. There was something about the sound that the composer was delivering that didn't have me as kind of relaxed and engaged in the music. And it's not about one being harsh and the other one being really smooth, they're not vastly different DAX. Yes, there's a tiny bit more attack in the case of the composer, but there's also that bit more congestion. And I never found the Iggy to be slow or overly relaxed or smoothed or rolled off. And yet somewhere I was able to enjoy and kind of groove along with the music better from the Iggy than I ever could with the composer. So whilst the composer is a very good example of a Delta Sigma DAC, I believe this comparison showed why the Iggy is a really great option for those that value a more open and more dynamic and engaging sound. And so before I get to my final comparison with the Chord Hugo TT2, I just want to quickly revisit my experiences with the Holo Audio Spring Level 3 KTE. I know that's a mouthful, if you don't understand what that means, check out my Holo Audio May and Spring review, but the Spring is essentially a similar price, it's a little bit more expensive DAC compared to the Iggy, it's a full R2R DAC, and I did a thorough comparison of the Spring Level 3 KTE with the Iggy in my Holo Audio review. Now I came away from that comparison feeling like the Iggy to me is the better value product. To me it did a lot of things better than the Spring, the Spring was a little bit soft on things like transients and attack, and so ultimately I would still recommend the Iggy over the Spring. But there's one thing I want to address here, and that is it's really important to remember when you're listening to any sort of review that it might sometimes come down to the system being used with it. So in my system and with all of my testing, the Iggy was clearly and comfortably better. There wasn't a combination where I ever found that I leant back towards the spring or I would have discussed that. But that doesn't mean the spring is definitively a bad DAC. It just means that if you're anything like me, if you tend to agree with my opinions, if you've got similar gear to me, then you're probably going to prefer the Iggy. Having said that, if you're using speakers, it's going to be completely different to headphones. And likewise, if you have a setup that's maybe got a more aggressive set of headphones in it, maybe you've got a pair of HD800s, the original HD800s, or maybe a pair of Focals that are a bit more aggressive on the top end, it is worth noting the system I'm using and the setup I'm using. And that's why I wanted to circle back around and say, I do still prefer the Iggy, but it's not to say the spring's bad. I think it's been a bit overhyped, but it's a nice r 2 r DAC, I just think the Iggy is better and cheaper, and that's why I continue to recommend it. And so with that said, let's move on and talk about the TT2. I haven't used the M scaler for this. This is just the TT2 versus the Iggy. I'm also using the same source chain still, so I'm using an external amp in the form of the Burson Soloist GT for this, and that's to separate the quality of the amplifier and the TT2 because I can't drive the Iggy through that same amplifier. So we've made everything an even playing field, it's just the DAC stage of the TT2 against the Iggy as a DAC. Now the TT2 retails for about $6,000, so we're talking about $3,400 more than the Iggy here. For that money though, you are getting an amplifier, an excellent headphone amplifier, and a preamplifier as well. So I was interested to see just how they compared. The TT2 for quite a while now has been my reference level DAC. I'm not saying it's the best DAC on the planet, but it's the best one I've had in my system so far. For this comparison, one of the tracks that came on was The Darkest Day by Ramona Falls. This is a really nice recording, and it played beautifully through both DACs. From the Iggy, I was hearing a sound that was clean and smooth, but not rolled off, not mushy or anything like that, just a very enjoyable refined sound. Once again, the soundstage is fairly compact, but not at all congested. One of the things that really stood out was the acoustic guitar in this track had a really nice sense of both attack, but also resonance and harmonic richness to it, coming from the Iggy. The lead vocal was quite forward in the mix, and it has a good sense of presence and weight with a bit of texture as well from the Iggy. There's also a violin and a viola that kicks in later in the track, and that was similar. Again, it had a good sense of texture 
and clarity, but also richness and presence too. Ultimately, everything I heard from the Iggy is what I've already described. It's a sound that has a good overall tonal balance with a nice sense of attack and clarity, but also a good sense of richness and harmonic resonance in the mix as well. So it was a really nice experience listening to The Darkest Day through the Iggy. Switching over to the TT2 at the DAC, I was immediately aware that there was more micro detail, more texture, more little subtleties that I could hear in the mix. It was like they weren't even present from the Iggy. And that's not a knock on the Iggy, it just goes to show why you would spend that much more in getting something like the TT2. From the TT2, that acoustic guitar I mentioned had a little bit more attack again, and it actually made it more lifelike. The Iggy sounded great, in isolation I wouldn't have thought that it needed any more attack, but in going to the TT2, it was almost like I went, oh okay, that's actually how the guitar is meant to sound. Again, it's not to say the Iggy's bad, but the TT2 just showed me there is that next level of performance. The vocals from the TT2 are a bit more textured, but it was still similarly placed and well focused. Likewise, that violin or viola had a little bit more texture applied as well. So across the board, everything I heard from the TT2 was like a more detailed and more textured version of what I'd already heard from the Iggy. Just everything improved a little bit. The tonality shifted a little tiny bit drier, and by drier, I mean there's a bit more sense of clarity, a slight reduction in richness, but it's a very, very minor step. One element that surprised me was that whilst both stacks have a bass presentation on this track, which is tight and punchy, moderately prominent, in moving to the TT2, I was actually shocked that that provided even more sense of the bass. Often people seem to think of the shit DAX as being a bit punchy in the bass, maybe a bit enhanced in the lower registers. But listening to the Iggy and then going to the TT2, it was actually the TT2 that came across with a bit more bass emphasis. Again, I wouldn't say either is overdoing it, neither sounds unnatural or emphasised, but I do know from my interview with Rob Watts who designed the TT2 that one of the things that comes forward when you start getting your transient timing just right is our brains can perceive bass better. So I'm going to put it down to that without knowing any other explanation for it and knowing that neither DAC is designed to enhance anything from a frequency response point of view. I'm going to assume that the TT2 is just delivering the transients in a way that allows the bass to be better perceived as opposed to enhanced. But what really matters is where all this left my ultimate opinion of the shit Yggdrasil. And that is, I think for $2,500 or $2,600, the shit Iggy OG is absolutely brilliant. As you probably already gathered, I don't think it's the last word in DAX. I don't think this is a DAC you could buy and say it's got the perfect sound and there's nothing better on the market, but it's absolutely a DAC that I think you could buy and say, I don't feel the need for anything more. Yes, you can get some extra micro details and some extra texture from something like a TT2. You can get a little bit more space in the sound potentially from some of the r 2 DACs on the market. But at the same time, I don't believe it's necessarily something that everybody should rush out for. And so I'm going to wrap all this up by saying, if you're looking for a really solid do-it-all DAC with great inputs, great outputs, an excellent sound that's engaging, enjoyable, with a good sense of space, a good sense of texture, but not overly aggressive like, say, the composer could be because of the Delta Sigma design, if that sounds like a DAC that you're looking for, then you should absolutely check out the shit Iggy OG. Now, whether or not the OG is better or worse than the less is more or the more is less, I unfortunately can't answer but I'm going to highly recommend the Iggy OG. I think it's a brilliant DAC. I think at the price, it's very, very hard to go wrong. If that sounds like a product that would suit you, I'll put a link down below through to Shit Audio. There's no affiliates, no kickbacks or anything like that. It's just a way of saying thank you to them for sending me out a review unit to try. As always, if you found this review useful, I'd love it if you'd hit subscribe, ring the bell, hit the like button, let YouTube know that you want to see more reviews like this from me. Don't forget as well that if you're interested in some curated playlists, come over and check out the Patreon options and benefits there. But for now, let me leave it to the music. So happy listening, and I'll see you here next time on Passion for Sound.